This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. At a campaign event in Virginia Tuesday, President Joe Biden blamed a heavy travel schedule for his disastrous debate performance last week, when he appeared disjointed, frequently lost his train of thought. Biden said, quote, didn't listen to my staff and came back and nearly fell asleep on stage, unquote. Meanwhile, The New York Times has a new report out today, saying Biden's aides, who've encountered him behind closed doors, say he's increasingly appeared confused or listless or with lose his thread of thought in conversations. This comes as Biden's facing growing calls to step aside, to not run for president again. Uh, Biden is meeting with Democratic governors today behind closed doors. He is later due to campaign in Wisconsin, but will not be joined by Democratic Senator Tammy Baldwin, who faces a competitive reelection and will be campaigning elsewhere in Wisconsin. At least 25 House members are reportedly preparing for a call for Biden to step down. On Tuesday, Biden faced his first call from a sitting Democrat in Congress to withdraw from the presidential race. Congressmember Lloyd Doggett of Austin, Texas, spoke on CNN. And I think we would be better off if we had a, a new candidate who could present a new vision for our country. Uh, and we can do that if we have an open and fair democratic process over the next few weeks. Also on Tuesday, former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said Biden's debate performance made a, quote, a legitimate question to say, is this an episode or is this a condition, unquote. Meanwhile, a key Biden ally, Democratic Congress member Jim Clyburn of South Carolina, told MSNBC's Andrea Mitchell he would support Vice President Kamala Harris if Biden withdrew, though he wasn't calling for that at the time. How would you feel if they worked around and tried to go around Kamala Harris because of her lack of high poll numbers and popularity and broadly based? Uh, do you think it's hers to have if it is not his? I will support her uh, if he were to step aside. For more, we're joined by James Zogby. He's president of the Arab American Institute, but was a longtime member of the Democratic National Committee's executive committee uh, from 2001 to 2017. He is a longtime member of the Democratic National Committee. He's proposed to the DNC chair what he says would be an open, transparent, and energizing process for the DNC. Uh, the Democratic National Committee to choose its nominee if Biden steps aside. Jim Zogby, this is the raging question everywhere. Um, can you talk about what that process would be? What exactly would happen if he did it before the convention, what this process is, during the convention or after? Well, thanks, Amy. Um, I've been pleased that in just a few days this has garnered so much uh, uh, support and discussion among Democrats, including Democrats on the National Committee. My goal was to uh, not allow this uh, to be left to the fates. Uh, Joe Biden steps down and Lord knows what we do. Um, I was trying to lay out a process that would uh, create an organized um, and very democratic and transparent process. Uh, to choose a new nominee. It would basically compress the primary process into a month. Um, there are 400 plus members of the Democratic National Committee. It would convene, uh, nominations would be open, and we would get uh, a, a requirement that anyone who wanted to be president or run in this primary would have to have the signature of 40 sitting members of the Democratic National Committee, including at least four from each of the four regions of the party. Now, very since there's only 400-plus members, very few people could actually do that. It would be people that we know. It would be Governor Whitmer. It would be Cory Booker. It would be Kamala Harris and Governor Newsom and Governor Pritzker and maybe Governor Shapiro from Pennsylvania. People already have a constituency and have states with members uh, enough members on the DNC that they would be able to get the, the required 40 in, in, in a week's time. Uh, then they would begin to campaign. They'd be certified by the secretary as legitimate nominees. They would show they have a national base of support among elected Democratic uh, Party officials. And uh, and then the party would organize a couple of uh, uh, town halls, televised town halls, where the candidates would appear. 
we'd go to the convention and it would be like the convention of 1960, where I'd be wall to wall uh, campaigning for delegates, uh, the elected delegates, most of whom are Biden delegates, he would release them. Um, and it'd be pretty exciting. The networks, uh, the media would cover it wall to wall as opposed to the way they cover these scripted uh, conventions now, which maybe give it an hour or two each night. Um, we'd have uh, nominations from the floor. We'd have the speeches given. We'd have the, the horse trading taking place between state delegations. Um, and an eventual nominee would be elected, probably after one more than one ballot. But it, people would leave the convention with the new nominee um, energized, with wind in, in that nominee's sails. Uh, I, I don't agree that with those who say, well, let Biden step out. If he steps out, Kamala should inherit it. I don't think it would be good for her. I think she should, if she is to be the nominee, she should be um, the, the result of a, a legitimate process in the convention that elected her. I think she'd win, but I think her winning ought to come uh, as a result of a consensus process within the party, it'd be good for her, good for the party, and I think it would ensure uh, the defeat of Donald Trump. Uh, but James, I mean, what do you say to those who would would argue that the uh, that the DNC delegates uh, would be uh, uh, disproportionately influenced by uh, lobbyists and 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 the moneyed uh, donors of the party who are so close to many of them? They're sometimes thinking, when they think of that, they're thinking of the, the folks appointed uh, by the, the, the chair. That, that's the case. Some of them are people who are it's friends of the chair or friends of uh, moneyed interests, et cetera, who become the, these at-large. There's only 75 of them. Um, most of the DNC members are state chairs, uh, national committee, committee people elected in the primaries in their states. Um, as national committee people um, to serve on the DNC. They're rank and file Democrats. They're organizers. They're people who've organized their own campaigns to win these elections. These are folks who are hardworking Democrats representing all 50 states and the territories in addition. So I, I don't agree with that. I mean, there, yes, there are some lobby folks and consulting people from the consulting class, et cetera, on the DNC. They're an absolute minority. Most of them are really hardworking uh, activist chairs and national committee people who've earned their earned their stripes working hard in the field. And, and what about you mentioned uh, Vice President uh, Kamala Harris? What about the possibility that uh, uh, denying her uh, as Vice President the chance to move uh, move up to presidential candidacy might open a, a racial rift within the party? I, I don't look. Number one, I think she'd probably win. Um, after all, she would have the support of the president. She'd have the support of uh, uh, Clyburn and many other Democrats. I think uh, uh, we have a significant number of, of members of the DNC right now who would support her, um, and certainly among the delegates um, uh, who would support her. Uh, but I think that she needs to win rather than it simply be handed to her. Uh, I want to see a unified, energized party uh, with a lot of excitement because they were part of a historic process of change. Uh, the president most likely would uh, would endorse her. I think that would be important. Uh, most of the delegates, remember, to the convention who would be there are Biden delegates. He'd release them, but he could release them with, I want you to support Kamala Harris. Better to do it that way than to simply say, by default, she becomes the candidate because she's been vice president. I, I look, I've had conversation with her uh, about issues I care about, about Gaza and the Middle East, I think uh, she she gets it. Um, and I would love to support her, but I think I need to see an energized and open process resulting in the nominee. I don't think that just passing the mantle is good for her, good for the party, uh, or good for this election. So, James Zogby, you explained what that process could look like uh, during the convention. Of course, Democracy Now! is going to be there. We're going to be expanding to two hours the whole week of Chicago, the uh, Democratic convention, as well as in Milwaukee uh, that week of uh, July 14th, expanding to two hours um, to cover the Republican convention. <clears throat> and I want to go there for a minute. Um, people's concerns about President Biden 
but also their deep concerns about uh, President Donald Trump's second presidency. And I wanted to go mm -hmm. back to that debate on Thursday night and get your response to what President Trump had to say when the issue of Gaza came up in the debate. Mm -hmm. He said, the only one who wants to keep going is Hamas. Actually, Israel is the one, and you should let him go and let him finish the job. He doesn't want to do it. He's become like a Palestinian, but they don't like him because he's a very bad Palestinian. He's a weak one. President Trump calling President Biden a weak Palestinian. Your thoughts on that and on President Trump overall? being the candidate for president, and President Biden saying, we're talking about an existential threat to democracy, and he says, I'm the only one who ever beat Donald Trump for president. Mm -hmm. I, I think he was—it it will always be remembered that Joe Biden is the one who knocked Donald Trump out of the White House in 2020. Um, I want a candidate strong enough to do it again. Um, Number one, number two, with regard to he is an existential threat, incidentally, I, I, and I think you know, I worry sometimes that if he wins, it's a danger. If he loses, the violence that will be unleashed if he loses will be a danger. This we have entered a very dark and I think a dangerous period in American history, and I think we have to deal with that. That's a topic for another show about why we haven't dealt with it and how we don't understand the appeal of of, of this man. But number two, on the question of Gaza. There is no question in my mind that this president, Joe Biden, has failed. There is genocide. There is clearly genocide. I was itching to get into the discussion that preceded me. This is a horror, and we have enabled it and allowed it to happen. I can't forget that. Even with that, and I, uh, I, the worry I have is that a Donald Trump in the White House would not only be a danger domestically, but it, what he has enabled Israel to do in the past, its annexations and et cetera, have been disastrous. I mean, they even removed the word occupied from human rights documents at the White House. We were ordered never to call West Bank Gaza occupied territory again. Uh, this is a very dangerous man. We need a president who can challenge this. I, I hope that the next Democratic nominee would challenge it. It's very clear. Uh, that we've seen um, the, the darkest uh, of American policy in the Middle East uh, unfold in the last uh, eight years. And I, I think we need to turn the page completely. And James Ogby, uh, could you d d discuss what you think would happen if President Biden decides to continue uh, to his candidacy? You know, what we saw after the debate was that media focused almost nonstop on every verbal gaffe, every uh, step, misstep, every sense of hesitation on his part. There's clearly a problem. Uh, there clearly is a problem. I don't want between now and November the attention of the press to be, did you hear what he said? Did you hear what he didn't say? Do you see him walk? Do you see him do this? That is not where this election needs to be. It doesn't need to be on what Joe Biden can't say or wasn't able to say but on what Donald Trump is saying and what the next Democratic president of the United States is saying about the future of our country. Uh, we have to turn the page so that we're not focused on this stuff, but focused, in fact, on policy and on a vision for the future. And, and frankly, you know, the media, it's like a, a dog with a bone. Now that they've grabbed hold of this issue, they're not going to let it go. It's the only thing people have been talking about for a week, and it'll continue. The next verbal gaffe will unleash another round of this. It's time to say, look, enough's enough. Let's focus on the future. Um, and like, look, can you, I can imagine Joe Biden giving a, a farewell address at the convention, uh, coming across as the true leader who sacrificed ambition for the sake of the country, who was willing to recognize the victory he won in 2020, the accomplishments of his first uh, few years before we got a crazy, dysfunctional Congress, uh, uh, a Republican-led Congress, um, and passing the mantle and passing the, the, the legacy that he wants to protect to a new candidate. That's the future for, for the party, but it's also the best way for Joe Biden to go out looking like a strong, visionary leader, as opposed to um, one gaffe after another being yet another drip, drip, drip 
with more members of Congress coming out, with more elected officials saying, eh, this is not working. That's not what we want. That's not what he wants. That's not the way for him to go out. He needs to go out on his own terms. Um, you know, the way the way this is playing out now. James Zogby, I have two quick questions. You're a longtime senior Democratic National Committee um, executive committee member until 2017. You're still a senior member of the Democratic National Committee. Explain who the delegates and superdelegates are. I don't know if people even understand that. And again, if Biden were to hang on during the convention and then afterwards, what would happen if he said, I'm stepping down in the race yeah. against Trump? I should say, Amy, that the, the nation is one that called me senior. I think senior simply meant I'm really old. Um, <laughs> there's, there's no title for senior. Um, I've just been on for 31 years, and uh, it's a long story how I got on and, and the fights I've been in and the difficulties I've had since I've been on, fighting for accountability and transparency with budget, et cetera, et cetera, against the Iraq war, things that they didn't want to do, but I continued to push. I've been a thorn, and I'm, I'm glad I've been a thorn in the side, because I've been on the right side of the many fights that I've been engaged in. And this is yet another fight, uh, one that I think we have to win. Um, delegates are people elected in the states along with the candidate that they support. So we'll have delegates from uh, the state of uh, Pennsylvania or Michigan. Uh, Joe Biden won, obviously, the primaries there. They'll pick a slate of delegates to run as Joe Biden delegates. They will also win when he wins, and they go to the convention. Super delegates are members of the Democratic National Committee who are automatically delegates at the convention and elected officials. Um, who are designated, uh, a certain number of them from different states, uh, are also designated as superdelegates. They're, uh, uh, they're elected officials who come to the convention to vote. Uh, the majority of the delegates are those elected in the states, not super. We did pass a rule after Bernie uh, in 2020 that said superdelegates couldn't vote in the first round. That was a way to not have the deck stacked against the grassroots candidates elected. Um, almost everybody has been elected by Joe Biden in this election. Um, 400 or so of the members of the Democratic National Committee are themselves elected on their own terms in their states. And then there are about 75 or so members of the Democratic National Committee appointed by the chair, whoever that chair happens to be. Um, and then there are the elected officials who will come. So those are the different groupings we're talking about. Um, and. Uh, we're already, like I said, seeing um, elected uh, Democratic uh, National Committee people saying, I'm uncomfortable with this. I'm afraid of what's going to happen in my state. And we just so have 15 I, I, seconds, but if you could say sure. what would happen if he wanted to step down in September? Uh, it would not be good for the person he passed the baton to. Uh, it's it's too late to have a process, and it would be—that would be— it, that would be the sooner he does it, the sooner we put in place a process that is orderly, open, transparent— and viewed as legitimate by the, the majority of Democrats. James Ogby, want to thank you for being with us. Former DNC executive committee member from 2001 to 2017, uh, current member of the Democratic National Committee, also president of the Arab American Institute. Happy birthday to Christine Marr. Democracy Now! is currently accepting applications for director of development to lead Democracy Now!'s fundraising efforts. Learn more at apply at democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez.